All right, so good evening, folks. Um, welcome to this uh, Cyber 644 UMBC Center for Cybersecurity guest lecture. Um, thanks also to Professor Costin for uh, helping set this up and uh, bringing our, our speaker uh, to us tonight. Our speaker tonight is uh, Joe Grant. Uh, he's a product designer, a hardware hacker, and the founder of Grand Idea Studios. Um, he specializes in creating, exploring, manipulating, and teaching about various electronic devices. And through uh, Grand Idea Studio, he's the inventor of the JTagulator, which is an open source hardware tool that assists in identifying on chip debug interfaces from test points, uh, via component pads, or connectors on target devices. So he's got a bit of a hardware hacking background as well. Um, before this, um, he was also known as Kingpin. Joe is a member of the legendary hacker group Loft Heavy Industries, or the Loft for short, where he, uh, he and his folks uh, really helped raise awareness of the hacker ethos and the importance of independent security and vulnerability research. Um, they, uh, they really were pathfinders in, in many ways, in a variety of ways, and uh, I've learned a lot from their work over the years. Uh, they really, you know, folks that we looked up to at the time back in the 90s and still to. So, uh, um, there's a wealth of knowledge here from the security industry as well. Uh, as part of Loft's um, uh, claim to fame, they made a history-making visit to Congress back in 1998, uh, where Joe was um, part of its group that testified before the Senate Committee on Governmental Affairs regarding government and homeland and computer security um, uh, concerns. And I think that was the talk where you all said you could bring the net down in 30 minutes, wasn't it? Yeah, Mudge said that. That I'm a hardware okay. person. I, I had no idea what he was talking about. Yeah, I, just, yeah. I just went with it. <laughs> right. Uh, but more recently, I mean, in addition to uh, you know his studios, um, he's brought engineering to the masses as co-host of Discovery Channel's prototype this show, which follows the real life design process of a unique prototype in every episode. By way of background, Joe holds a Bachelor of Science degree in computer engineering from Boston University and an honorary doctorate of science and technology from the University of Advancing Technology in Tempe, Arizona. Uh, and with that, I'd like to go ahead and turn the, uh, the virtual floor over to Joe Grand. Joe, welcome to UMBC. Great to see you again. And um, the show is yours. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Please, no applause. <laughs> um, yeah, that was uh, quite an intro. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, my background is in hardware hacking, even though, you know, I was in the loft, which is very software network focused. I've always been passionate about hardware and electronics and creating mischievous devices, but also making devices do mischievous things or do things that they weren't intended to do. Um, and it's just been a really interesting journey uh, to be able to be a hacker full time, uh, to me is mind blowing. And every day to be able to do what I love to do and hack on stuff and be in my lab and even like write code and, and reverse engineer software and do hardware stuff, like it's just amazing. Um, so it's very, very cool, and I appreciate um, being here and, and you guys listening to this uh, now or in the future. This particular presentation um, is called That Time I Hacked a Hardware Wallet and Recovered $2 Million. And this was really a, a foray into a technique uh, of hardware hacking called fault injection, where basically you are intentionally causing faults in a system, usually some sort of like physical fault uh, to create uh the system or have the system do something that it wasn't intended to do so you're trying to do the this certain type of attack at a very specific point in time and um this just sort of happened organically where a lot of times like if i'm learning a new skill sometimes i'll do it if i have the time and i'll experiment and be like oh i want to try this technique or this technique um sometimes it just has to be the right kind of uh the, the right timing and this particular project i had received an email um from somebody that basically out of the blue like I, it was during like um like 2021 when this project started late 2021 i think like traveling wasn't really open and what i do a lot of times is travel around and teach hardware hacking and get out of the lab and do stuff so i was kind of sitting around at home with nothing to do um and got this email from uh from somebody i didn't know who they were and they said i'm reaching out because of an issue i have with my trezor wallet uh and i'll explain what that is in 2017, I bought some crypto and haven't touched it, uh, touched the wallet. When I was moving earlier this year, I think that I accidentally threw out the recovery seed. And the recovery seed being the private key or associated with the private key that lets you access your, your cryptocurrency. Um, 
And, uh, and this was something where it was just the right timing of me being around and being curious about like, oh, I want to try to learn about these new techniques. Um, how hard could it be? And that's what started this like ridiculous journey. So uh, before we get into the actual process of all of this, uh, the Trezor is one type of hardware uh, device that's used to store cryptocurrency. And this is called the Trezor Model 1. Um, I will have a caveat of like, I was not involved in cryptocurrency at all before this. Um, I had zero interest in it. And even today have very little interest in it other than realizing that people need help recovering their cryptocurrency that they've been locked out of um, on their wallets, hardware, software, and things. So it sort of spawned this little side business of, of helping people, um, but it's more for the technical challenge than it is like my belief in cryptocurrency. Um, which a lot of cryptocurrency people are bummed about because they're like, oh, are you Bitcoin maxi or whatever? And it's like, I don't know. <laughs> like, I'm just a hacker that happens to hack on stuff. And right now it's it's hardware wallet um, related. And the cool thing is a lot of these devices are basically like electronic systems, embedded systems, um, which is what I grew up designing and hacking and everything. So it was just another sort of fun, you know, uh, step to take. So these devices, um, all of them, not just this one in particular, but uh, they'll have some sort of pin or password to give you access to the device. And if you enter that too many times, it's going to erase the content. Um, so Dan, uh, the person that had emailed me, had tried a couple pin attempts, but they didn't want to take that risk of erasing everything. Um, so they stopped. And they're like, maybe we can find somebody to hack it. If they can hack the device, maybe they can get the recovery seed, which will then give me access um, to the crypto. So cryptocurrency. Um, so yeah, so that's how it started. Uh, the process of hardware hacking, and I'll get into specifics about what we did with the Trezor, but just as sort of a background, if you're if you're interested in hardware hacking or you're you know curious about it, or maybe you've done it, uh, this is kind of the process that I go through pretty much every single time I, I work on a project. And not every step is required, but I like to kind of exhaust the different sections as I go, just so I don't miss anything. And a lot of times with hardware hacking, just like software reverse engineering or anything, like you're kind of gathering clues and you might notice like, oh, well, that bit changes. Why does that bit change? I don't know yet. You might find it later. So going through the hardware hacking process in kind of this formal way uh, lets you capture as much information as you can that might help later. So starting off with like information gathering, and this is the stuff I did with the Trezor device as well, um, trying to get as much information about the target before you even do any work on it. So this is like um, OSINT types of stuff, open source intelligence gathering, Google searching. The Trezor in particular was open source, which was great because I could go to their website, get the schematics, the electronic design of the system, uh, get the firmware, I could start looking through the code. And that made it much easier than with like a black box system, something that isn't open source, where then you have to basically reverse engineer stuff from either from scratch or with, you know, maybe get some binary somewhere and you look through it, uh, which doesn't mean it's any more secure. It just means it's going to maybe take you a little bit longer to get there. Um, but getting as much information as I could uh, about the target, but also about any prior work that had been done. And I'll get into that specifically with this project, um, because we're all standing on the shoulders of giants. Whatever hacking field we're in, cybersecurity field we're in, we're all, we're all doing it. Rick had mentioned... Uh, you know, the loft being influential. And it's like, we were maybe influential to future people. We had influences that that were influential to us doing early hacking stuff, right? So it's always, we're always kind of innovating and growing on, on each other's work. And that's really important with, with hacking in general of like, does something already exist? Do I have to recreate the wheel? Or can I go and find some existing vulnerability, some existing technique that I might be able to apply somewhere else? Um, then we get into product teardown. So you have your hardware. I keep looking around because I thought I had one here, but I don't. I have some of the other work I'm doing related to the uh, the Trezor one, and there's some other stuff I can't lift up. Um, but basically, getting your target hardware and taking it apart, getting access to the physical circuitry that you're going to do your attack on. Once you have access to the circuitry, you can identify the components. You can uh, try to get a sense of the complexity of the system, see if there's any chips on the board that might be communicating to each other, and then think about how could I possibly attack the device. Then we get into the next level down of buses and interfaces. So looking at the chips, if they are communicating, or if I see two chips on the board, and I assume that they're gonna be talking, or maybe I do some analysis and figure out, oh, there's an inter-chip communication bus that I can 
tap onto. Then you can monitor the signals, you can analyze the signals, you can emulate signals, sort of like using Wireshark for Ethernet, Wi-Fi, whatever. Um, we can do the same thing at a chip level to monitor communication. That's also something where we go, okay, there's probably some sort of debugging interface that exists on the chip that lets us connect with special hardware, like what I just held up, um, that will connect to a debug interface and then let you run software that you can step through, control the CPU and like step through the code and view memory and view registers and change memory and change registers and change the program counter and do everything that you want, sort of like reverse engineering or, or debugging a piece of software, um, doing that with hardware. And at that level of, of the hardware analysis in this buses and interfaces, we wanna look for those types of interfaces that exist on chips. Sometimes they're locked and that is what happened with the Trezor, which I'll explain, uh, but that's what we look for. Memory and firmware is another level down of like, okay, we know that there's gonna be memory on the device somewhere that has the firmware, so the program code, maybe there's other configuration data. In our case, we wanna go for the recovery seed or the private key, you know, whatever that private piece of information is, we wanna to try to find that. So different techniques of getting access to memory. And then chip level, which we don't go into in this uh, project, but that's getting physical access to the silicon chips themselves. So, geez, do I have anything that I can show? Uh, no, everything's like kind of, well, let's see here. I'll, I'll pan this down here. So underneath this little sensor here, there's you know a black chip. So the integrated circuit is the actual chip. The chip level hacking is getting Depackaging, so taking the plastic cover off of the chip, getting to the actual silicon die inside, where it's basically like a microscopic circuit board with layers of metal and transistors and all sorts of stuff. But you're dealing with the same sort of attack process that we talk about at a higher level, but with microscopic microscopic features, um, much more expensive equipment to do it. Uh, but sometimes that's necessary. In our case, for this project, it wasn't. Sometimes it is, and not everybody has access to those types of tools. I don't. Um, I just happen to know people that do. And then you could outsource that or, you know, uh, work with them, collaborate. Uh, so a lot of times hardware hacking and hacking in general really is kind of knowing what's possible and then, um, you know, going from there. So our target on the Trezor device is the microcontroller, which is the STM32F2 family. Um, most microcontrollers nowadays will have a debug interface, like I mentioned, so a way that we can connect directly to the chip, but it will also have some sort of security mechanism. So you can't just connect to it and extract the contents anymore, uh, though sometimes you still can, but a lot of times they'll implement some sort of security and that security is going to uh, protect the internal memory. Uh, it will protect any debug interfaces. So there might be a, de a debug interface that's being used during development, the engineers are using it, they're programming it and testing it. Uh, and then during manufacturing, maybe the manufacturer programs the final version of firmware in there, and then they lock it. And then in theory, depending on the microcontroller, once it's locked, you're not gonna be able to get access to it. Sometimes there's other security features that are like, it gives you a subset of access, but not the full access that you might need. It really depends. There's no standard about like how chips are supposed to do their security um, or anything like that. So. Uh, it's very chip specific and we just deal with whatever that we find. If there is some sort of security on the chip, it's usually going to happen and, and be checked at the beginning of the boot process. Um, a lot of times with microcontrollers, and I never really thought about this, but microcontrollers have their own code that's in what's called the boot ROM that executes before the user code runs. So it has its own code that's running kind of like BIOS or UEFI, or, you know, some low level thing on a PC. Same sort of thing where it's like running before it runs, uh, say before it loads the kernel or before it loads the operating system or file system or whatever. On electronic systems like embedded systems that are more general purpose um, resource constrained computing systems, usually it's not multiple stage of boot, but it could. But at a minimum, the chip is gonna be executing some of its own code, which is really pretty cool. And that means that code is inside the chip somewhere. Sometimes that's hard coded. So you can get you know, your silicon access, uh, extract the, the bits essentially to recreate what, what that boot ROM is. Sometimes you can get to it through the boot, uh, uh, the boot or sorry, the uh, debug interface. So you can connect to the debug interface and read that section of memory. But whatever it is, like it's running its own code, it configures itself, then it maybe has a bootloader and then it will run the user code. So there's all these different steps. 
our target generally is going to be that first box, the boot ROM or the configuration where it's executing the boot ROM and then setting up uh, the chip itself. So the clock, um, any sort of memory me memory mapping that has to happen. And a lot of times during that configuration is where the chip says, is my security enabled? Yes or no. Is my debug interface enabled? Yes or no. So if we can target those yes or no's and cause some misbehavior to change that response, that's what we want to go after. So yeah, here's our here's our target um, for uh, for the Trezor, the STM thirty two F two hundred five, and this is something where there are devices that have better security. Um, Trezor, in this case, chose intentionally they say to use one that uh, is more of a general purpose device because then they get access to the data sheet, they can share that information. Uh, with the trade off being somebody could you know with physical access hack the device, uh, but we're basically going to target the security mechanism of this chip, so then we can get the contents out of it. And it turns out that for this particular attack, uh, not only did we need to bypass the security of the chip, but luckily there was a bug in the user code firmware that Trezor wrote that we could exploit as well and take advantage of. Um, they've since fixed that particular problem, but it turns out that with the STM32, that's never going to be fixed because it's a hardware-based problem in the boot ROM, and the only way to fix that in this particular type of chip is to respin the silicon. Um, and th there's like billions with a B uh, out there in the world of these types of devices, not just Trezors, but other types of STM32s. And um, and it and and it hasn't been hasn't been fixed. And I'll, I'll show you how I know that. So the security for the STM32 uh, uses something called RDP, which is like readout protection or read protection. And there's basically three different le levels. <clears throat> Um, we'll start with level zero. So level zero basically means no security at all. Chip is totally open as you would have during development. There is level one and level one is kind of this intermediate stage where debug access is still given, but you can't access internal memory. You can only access Ram. So you can't get to the flash where the program code is or other like non-volatile things, but you can access Ram and that's sometimes used, you could like load a little program into RAM that maybe depending on the chip has access to other things, um, but it's kind of a it, this state that is somewhat useful, somewhat not. And then there's uh, RDP level two, which is like maximum security where the, the debug interface doesn't respond, uh, nothing, nothing works. The way that that check happens is if you look at the slides, I keep looking over here because that's where my slides are. Um, the the chip the boot rom is going to power up it's going to check the state of this rdp which is basically like a um i think it's an eight byte or sorry an eight bit value and if rdp if that value reads as aa then that means uh the chip is going to be at rdp level zero so everything's open if that byte reads cc that's rdp level two if that byte reads anything else besides aa or cc that's rdp level one so it's sort of like Basically, anything other than AA or CC is going to get us into RDP level one, which gives us access to RAM. That's kind of what we want to get to. So our goal would be to go from RDP level two, which is what the Trezor is, completely locked down. All we have to do is basically cause that, um, that reading of the RDP byte at just the right time to get corrupted and go from CC to anything else besides AA. Going, you know, if we're flipping one bit, that's pretty good. So we have 255, or we have eight bits. So you know, there's some chance of, of flipping a bit to, uh, to be anything other than CC. To flip all the bits to go from CC to AA would be wild. Uh, very, very, very unlikely. But to go from CC to CD, or to CB, or to uh, whatever else, something, some bit minus C, like that's possible. So that's kind of the goal of getting from RDP level two to RDP level one, and then we'll take advantage of the of the, the, the bug in the Trezor firmware also. But then you might say, oh, well, what if you, you know, Trezor patched the problem um, because this STM32, I'll, I'll, ex I'll explain a little bit. I'll explain actually our, the process of what we're doing with the debug interface, but the STM32 also has uh, another interface called a bootloader, which gives you different access. And we can basically get ourselves into the bootloader instead and then do additional glitches to give us access to flash so that's why like even though trezor fixed the problem that i'm talking about here uh the actual stm32 f2 is still vulnerable just in a slightly different way um but still 
doing that initial fault injection to cause corruption. Um, and then again, another fault injection to corrupt uh, when we're in the bootloader stage. So it's, it's kind of fun. It's like this whole playground of things. Um, so fault injection, like I just mentioned, is the, the tool that we're going to be using. It's kind of like a hammer. Uh, and with every type of security tool um, or any type of engineering tool, right? You can use it in a in a constructive way to like build something, or you can use it in a way to like bash something open. Uh, and in our case, we're using fault injection as, as a way to get us what we want and get execution and basically get corruption of that read value. Um, but it's a very, very cool tool to have and a, a very neat skill. And this is something where this is the technique that I hadn't really paid attention to much. Uh, I was kind of just looking for that right opportunity and that's when this, this came about. So fault injection is all about uh, intentionally causing a fault in a system at just the right time that's going to give you some benefit. Uh, we've heard about some like software-based faults, uh, and there's actually been some hardware-based faults, like more complex CPU stuff, like uh, like row hammer um, and crazy fault types of things in that world. But really for embedded systems um, or really any microcontroller, like we're doing some physical change that's going to cause a fault that we can take advantage of. A lot of times when we do fault injection, we just cause the chip to crash. Like it doesn't actually do anything that we want. But if we're lucky and we get it just right, we get the parameters just right, which I'll explain, um, maybe we can have it skip over an instruction. Maybe we can have it corrupt the, the read or corrupt the write of something that's happening. And we need to do enough reverse engineering of the system to understand where we want to inject our fault. Um, so in our case, we know what our goal is to corrupt that RDP value. So we need to figure out where that is. Um, but it all comes down to like, how lucky can you be at just that right time? Most chips, all chips actually, um, are de designed to meet certain characteristics. And the manufacturer will have a chart like this in their documentation. And they'll say, we as the manufacturer guarantee functionality within this gray box. So you as the engineer, it's your responsibility to make sure that your, your design falls within that gray box. And that way everybody's compliant and, and the thing is gonna work, it's gonna be guaranteed to work. But from a hacker perspective, we say, okay, great. If we know how the chip is supposed to function, what if we operate outside of those parameters to intentionally cause it to not function the way that, that, that the designer wants? Uh, so we can look at documentation like this and see, for example, like the minimum voltage range that the chip can operate. So we say, okay, if we bring the chip below two volts, maybe that's gonna do something. If we run the chip, faster than say 20 megahertz, maybe that's gonna do something. A lot of times we don't exactly know what's happening with that glitch, with the fault. It's trick, tricking some logic, it's doing something internal to the chip transistor level, we don't really know. Uh, so a lot of times it's just kind of guessing and trying to narrow down your range and hope, hoping for some success. So yeah, there is a lot of sort of legwork into where do you want to inject your glitch? How, how wide, what are your parameters of your glitch? Um, how, you know, how, how, uh, uh, how, are you, how are you triggering your glitch? Like what sort of indicator is it that you're, that you're using to know when to do your glitch? So all of these things is like, that's the major reverse engineering work that has to happen. We're using, our, our type of fault injection we're using is called uh, voltage fault injection. So we're basically, sometimes you hear power fault injection. We're basically taking the power line that's connected directly to the CPU and like brown, browning it out, like turning it off and on really quickly, like nanoseconds, picoseconds, something like that, microseconds. I can't remember. We'll see what the width is. Um, so basically turning it off and on uh, fast enough where the system is still going to function, but then you've caused that fault to, to skip over something or corrupt something or get the response that you want. There's also timing-based fault injection. So you can control the clock and inject faster clocks. There's optical faults. You could decap the chip and shine a laser onto it. There's other voltage injection techniques. There's a whole world, like people spend, um, I wouldn't say their entire careers because it's somewhat of a relatively new concept that, that at least in the mainstream um, kind of hacker world, but uh, definitely like PhD level years of research into all the different types of fault injection, or you could focus your work on one microcontroller and spend years looking at it. Um, so it is this new field relatively new, like people have been using it back in the 80s uh, and, and early 90s for like smart card based bypassing and stuff. But now it's something, especially using the tools that I'll explain, 
that more people can get into, but it's really a fascinating world. So I mentioned kind of standing on the shoulders of giants and using existing work that's out there. When I first got the email about hacking the Trezor, I knew that people had proven that you could hack the Trezor. Uh, so there's a presentation, Wallet.Fail, that was at the Chaos Computer Congress, uh, 35C3 in December 2018. There was Chip.Fail that was given at Black Hat 2019. Uh, so same guys, sort of similar attacks, talking about fault injection. Um, so when I got the email, I was like, all right, I'll just replicate that work. And uh, you've probably experienced this in the academic world of like, oh, you read a paper, you want to replicate that work so you can build on it. Um, sometimes the paper doesn't really give everything or, or it's just your environment is different and replicating it is harder. Uh, and that's the reality of things. And that's what I learned um, doing this. It took much, much longer than just replicating what was publicly available. But what they had proven is the chip powers up. It reads the boot ROM. It does that RDP check. And that's where we want to do our fault injection. They had even gone as far as doing some power side channel measurements. So basically measuring the power consumption as the chip is booting up to be able to try to determine like, where is it reading the boot ROM? Where is it reading the, the configuration values? And then where is it running user code? And that way you can narrow down where you want to actually do your, your fault injection. So um, if you look at this graph, they're basically showing, okay, the, the boot ROM starts because there is going to be some spike when the, when the chip powers up. There's kind of these spikes of, of things that are happening, but it's sort of small power consumption. Uh, and then there's a little bit more power consumption where the, the boot ROM is reading the locations in flash. So it's a little bit of flash memory access, which requires more power. That's where it's reading in, presumably, the RDP value and a bunch of other values as well. Uh, and then the application, the user code starts running where it gets really messy. And the way you could do this is you, you can have a chip, you load your chip uh, on a development board, for example, like something you control, you load it with code that's going to like pull a pin high as soon as the user code starts. So then you can kind of go backwards from there and say, okay, I know at this point is where my code starts running. Let's go backwards and, and take a guess at what's happening. And there's other tricks you can do also. But this was a huge slide, like knowing this, knowing that sometime after power up uh there's going to be a region where the rdp value is red like that's where we can target so that was a that's a really really uh, important piece of research sometimes when you're when you are dealing with fault injection you need to prepare your circuit boards you can't just like plug stuff in and have it work uh with power and voltage based fault injection um in particular they're very small spikes um, and usually with digital systems, you'll have capacitors on the different power rails to essentially absorb spikes that are there. So kind of clean up any noise that that's in the system, um, to make sure that the microcontroller or whatever other digital device is getting clean power. If we left capacitors in that might prevent our glitch from actually doing anything. So you usually need to prepare the board, take the capacitors off of the board. Um, or of your your target system, so it doesn't smooth out those uh, the, those the the spikes uh, in the dips, so you can actually get your proper fault injection. And sometimes though, you need to leave certain capacitors in. Sometimes you have to take certain ones out. So it's it, it's just like it's kind of this black magic. Like you don't really know until you start experimenting. In our particular case, what was cool is this STM thirty two. Uh, we see this 3.3 volt rail. That's the power rail that powers the chip. So it has an internal voltage regulator that's then going to uh, bring down the voltage for the CPU core voltage, which is around like 1.2 volts. It also would then pass that 3.3 volts to the memory and to the other peripherals inside of the chip. Um, so we don't actually have a direct connection to the core voltage that we would need to do our glitch until you look at the block diagram and then you realize, oh, wait, we do. Usually when there are internal voltage regulators inside of chips, there needs to be some external capacitor that's going to provide the, the enough capacitance for stability of that regulator. Um, you don't usually see those inside of the chips themselves. I think maybe because the capacitance is too big and maybe it can't fit in the chip or whatever it is. So if we look at the output of the core regulator, we actually see a line coming out and then there's an external capacitor to ground. We can cut th that external capacitor out and then we can feed in our own voltage at that point. Uh, basically, if we feed in a voltage high enough, it disables the internal regulator. And now we can completely control the core voltage. And that's where we provide our glitch on that voltage line. 
that's coming in. So sometimes you have to do some manipulation like that. Other times you just feed directly into the, the power rail and that's all you need. So it, again, like is very chip specific. So once I started working on this, um, at first what I did is kind of looked at the wallet.fail work, tried to get my setup similar to theirs as far as like doing fault injection. Some, their slide had said 200 microseconds after boot. I think it was like around 160 microseconds after the chip starts booting is when uh, it's doing the, that RDP check. So kind of trial and error of getting stuff working. And this is when I realized like, okay, this, this stuff is like a lot harder than, than, than people say, uh, a lot harder than it seems. And it turns out like every single thing matters. So the length of the wire matter. Um, the type of wire that you're using, the, the cables, the, the, the tools that you're using, like everything matters as far as the timing of things and the success or not, no success um, of, of the actual fault injection. So it really is even today, like being in, you know, being a hacker, a lot of times people are like, oh, you think outside the box and you do whatever. Um, but I'm really an engineer also. And I like precision in knowing if I do this, this is going to happen. If I change this value, this is going to happen. Fault injection is one of those things where you have zero idea. You can kind of, you kind of have a sense of it, but you don't really know. And that drives me absolutely crazy. Um, every project I work on, you just don't really know. And and if anybody says otherwise, like they're they're either lying or they're using like really, really, really expensive equipment that kind of does a lot of the characterization for you. Um, but it's very fascinating also, but it's something to keep in mind of like when you're replicating this stuff, like everything, everything matters. So here's some of like shots of my lab as I was poking around with everything. And um, I wrote some code, some Python code to interact with this chip whisper device, which is uh, a device created by um, a friend of mine, Colin O'Flynn, who runs a company, New AE Technology. And he basically single-handedly made fault injection accessible to the masses. This tool also is for uh, side channel analysis, so power analysis and being able to measure power consumption specifically during uh, um, cryptocurrency or, oh my God, uh, cryptographic operations. So AES, things like that, where you can measure power consumption and then actually extract uh, enough information to figure out what bits were being used at a certain point in time and then turn that back into an actual key. Um, and he has tons of sample code and tutorials and everything. So really it was his work that I think started as PhD work that makes it so accessible to all of us. There are a lot of other platforms, but this really was like that catalyst for a lot of people. So I wrote some code, tried to get everything working, lined up, you know, my timings, and I just thought everything was working, but I just couldn't get it working. And I got to the point of like, am I like serious imposter syndrome at this point too, of like, should I even be calling myself a hardware hacker anymore? Like what is going on? Um, so I got to the point of writing a letter to ST Microelectronics, the engineers at, at, at ST saying, hey, um, you know, I wanted to know if like maybe the chip had been patched where the chips I was using like just weren't weren't working. Because I was using at this point just my own little development development chips. Like you can see the lower left, there's that little um, clear box with some chips in it. I also had it hooked up to, to the Trezor, but I was using some of my own chips as testing and like nothing was working. So I emailed them and, and, and said, I didn't say I was going to hack it. I said, hey, I'm thinking of uh, designing a new device with your STM32 F2, a little bit of a, a white lie. Um, have you fixed the, like, are you aware of the fault injection problems of the chip? Have you fixed those problems? Um, basically telling, you know, call, calling them out and saying, I know that the chip is vulnerable. Have you fixed it? Um, and then they respond and say, uh, we're aware of the, uh, of the work. Kraken is another team that had done some fault injection work around the STM32 F2. So we're, we're aware of this work. Um, there's no revision done uh, in regards to fault injection. Um, however, what I didn't put in here, it said, however, like we recommend you use this other chip that has security features, more expensive, blah, blah, blah. So trying to steer me towards something else. But with production manufacturing, a lot of times, like even if I wanted to use a more expensive secure chip, sometimes it's just not in the budget or there's other constraints that I have to deal with. Um, so people sometimes have to implement insecure devices whether they want to or not, or they might not even know it's insecure yet. Um, but I thought this was interesting. This really let me know, okay, the chips themselves are vulnerable. So the problem must be on my side, right? There must be some sort of uh, coding issue, whatever, some hardware issue, wiring, something else. 
Um, but it kind of gave me, even though now I knew it was my fault, uh, but it still gave me this motivation of like, okay, now I know it's, it's vulnerable still, I'm going to keep going with it. And yeah, so still hasn't been fixed. Um, eventually I did it. Um, I can't exactly remember what, what, uh, what wasn't happening. It may have been timing related, but I ended up having some code basically running through a whole, a whole range of timing. Once the chip powered up, um, trying glitching, trying to connect to the debug interface, trying glitching, trying to connect to the debug interface different width glitches, different timing offsets, um, and eventually hit a spot and just had it running over and over and over and over again. So we can see here error count in that screenshot, 802. That means I had tried 802 times and was successful in causing that fault 135 times, which is actually a pretty good range. Uh, since then, my range has, got, has gotten lower as I've tried to make the attack. Uh, more repeatable, but more safe as well. Um, but this was a screenshot I took uh, to send a message to my wife. And I was like, oh, I did it. Yay. Uh, and that was like a huge turning point. Once I proved I could glitch the chip, then I could go about like trying to actually target the, uh, the, the treasure itself. So here's a screenshot of my, my Python uh, notebook that was running. And I'm basically, yeah, glitching, checking power cycling, glitching, checking, power cycling. And as soon as I was able to connect to the debug interface, that proves that I shifted from RDP level two to RDP level one. And now I got access to the chip. And we can see it says device ID equals 4BA00477. Um, I'm, commu I'm connecting to the chip and getting and asking for its device ID. So the fact that I can do that, which you can't do in RDP level two, tells me that I'm there. Uh, and that's pretty cool. So that was at least validation that I could cause a fault in the chip. Um, there's a whole story behind this also that I'm not going to go into in the presentation. Um, as far as like, once I got to this point, I still had to figure out how to do it on the Trezor. And um, basically though, what happened is I was just screwing around. Now that I knew I could generate the fault, um, what was happening is I was faulting the system and I could get to the debug interface, but the memory was, was empty. So the RAM was empty. But I knew from, from some, of the, um, some of the existing work that there should be a way to put contents into the RAM, into the memory, but my chip was crashing. There was nothing in memory. Like it was, it was still very frustrating. Um, and then something happened. Like I was trying a lot of different timings and, and messing with my code. And all of a sudden, one of my examples, one of my tests, I was able to read the recovery seed, which was stored in the clear in this particular version of the Trezor. Um, out of the device, but I couldn't replicate it. I was like, oh my God, I did it. And then I, I ran it again, it didn't work. And I ran it again and again, it didn't work. So like something happened one time that I could read it and I just could not figure it out. And that we go into much more of like that in, in the video that we made that, that's on YouTube. I'll mention that at the end. Um, but it was something where my wife was like, well, you did it, you caused it to happen once. So you try to recreate your steps. Like, what did you do? And I just tried all this stuff and just couldn't figure it out. Um, even to this day, I realize how lucky this process was because now that I've gone back and I've hacked a lot more treasures since then, um, but there is always this risk of something going wrong and erasing memory or causing some other corruption in the chip and, and things like that. So this whole process, it turns out that I was just super, super lucky. So anyway, I realized like, okay, the fact that I saw it once means something had to have happened. So that's when I started looking through the source code of the Trezor and found the spot where the, the code actually is making a copy of the recovery seed that's normally stored in flash memory that's protected, copying that into RAM on power up. Um, but because my fault injection was causing crashing almost all of the time, this code was never executing to copy the um, contents into RAM. But the one time I saw it is when it happened to not crash and still get there. So it was still like sort of showing with fault injection, like a lot of times you are getting these crashes. But then once I saw this, I was like, all right, now I can try to fine tune my glitch to maybe have it like not crash as often, but still glitch and be successful to get to this point in the code execution once I uh, downgrade RDP level two, which is in the boot ROM. So basically doing the fault injection and then having it still run the user code enough to get to this point. Uh, so it's just all this whole chain of things. But this is where... It's actually this line of code is where we see the mem copy 
Um, it's taking the, 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 the memory, the start of memory or the start of the memory range, which is called the metadata uh, in this particular device, and basically copying that um, or copying data into that um, storage uh, area that's in RAM. So I don't know why that was happening, but the fact that that information was being copied into RAM means once I did the downgrade and properly got the thing to not crash so often, um, I could go in, downgrade the device, get access to the RAM, the recovery seed and the pin were in the RAM, in the clear for this version of firmware, and then I could get the code out. Or sorry, get the get the uh, the seed and the pin out that I needed. So that once I saw that code, I was like, all right, now I know I gotta, now I just have to tighten everything up and get stuff working. So that was pretty cool to be able to see that. If we didn't have the code, like I mentioned, then you'd have to do more reverse engineering um, to try to get this. And that would change your approach a little bit because you would need to extract the, the flash from the device probably. And then in that case, you'd have to do different fault injection to get there. Uh, but this was, this was pretty cool. Trezor did fix this. They removed this particular problem. Um, and later versions of firmware, they encrypt all of the, the contents and they don't move it into RAM. So now the goal is get access out of flash. If you can get to the flash, now you get the encrypted contents out of flash, and then you could brute force the encryption and get the still get the recovery seed. It's just a different approach um, for the later versions of code. So yeah, that was pretty cool. Um, here's the setup that I used for this particular attack. Uh, again, it, it's changed since then because I've still been refining things, but I have the chip whisper, which is causing the fault injection. I'm using uh, another tool called the Phi Whisperer, which is a, uh, in this case, a USB protocol analyzer, also that Colin O'Flynn made. Um, and this lets you monitor USB traffic. Uh, so again, you can do that with Wireshark sort of software-based, uh, but this is a hardware-based protocol analyzer that plugs in line with whatever you're communicating with. So you can monitor USB traffic and then cause a trigger, use that as your starting point to feed into your fault injection tool if you wanted to. I'm just using it to power on and off the Trezor, because the STM32 only checks the RDP value on power up of the chip. Some chips, you could just do a soft reset and it will check the state of security. Uh, but the STM32, you have to do a full power cycle. It turns out that you don't even need that. You could just get away with um, connecting the 3.3 volt output from the chip whisperer directly to uh, the 3.3, basically like bypassing the voltage regulator on the uh, Trezor itself. Um, so I have started doing that to get rid of that piece of equipment to simplify it. But in this case, that's what I was using. Then I have a Sager J-Link. That is this device. So that's a, a, a very common off-the-shelf engineering tool used for debug interface connections. So the Sager, um, the J-Link can connect over JTAG, which is an industry standard debug interface, or SWD, which is a, a serial wire debug, which is an ARM-specific debug interface, sort of a subset of JTAG. And that's what we're using um, on the STM32. So that's the device that I'm using to, to query the device to see if I have debug access or not. Oh, and then there's also, sorry, there's a bunch of um, uh, kind of um, interface circuitry as well. So that whiteboard kind of takes the uh, J-Link connections, takes the uh, glitch output from the chip whisperer, and then feeds everything um, onto the Trezor device. So that's kind of like the, the basic. Here's what the Trezor looks like inside. Uh, that row of six connections down at the bottom, that's the debug interface. So you could actually just solder wires to those, which is handy. If, if those weren't there, you'd have to figure out another way to connect to it, probably by soldering wires to the chip itself. Um, there was a, 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 a like a coding on top of the, of the device, which is some sort of conformal coding. I don't know if it was like urethane or silicone or something soft that protects the uh, components from dust and moisture and everything, because it's sort of an out, you know, it's an external device that people put in their wallets and leave in their safe or whatever, uh, exposed potentially to the elements. So there was a coating that you had to get off in order to make electrical contact and be able to solder. Uh, but other than that, yeah, everything's there accessible for you. The capacitors are really small to take them off, but you can, you know, use a soldering iron to do that. Here's the schematic of the Trezor one. Uh, so I could actually look and see where are the capacitors that I need to remove, what are their part designators, and then line that up with the drawing of the of the Trezor, looking at the part designators that uniquely identify each part to figure out which ones to take off. So these are the modifications that I had to do the, to the Trezor to make it susceptible uh, to the fault injection. So I mentioned that we made a video about this. Um, 
prior to this video, like I've made videos before. Um, usually it's me with the phone, like showing something very engineering focused, uh, or, uh, like Rick mentioned, prototype. This was a show on discovery channel that was, you know, for mainstream sharing engineering. Um, but my production quality wasn't really that good. Uh, besides, you know, unless somebody else is hiring like the camera, camera person and, and film crew to do it. Um, but this was something where my wife was like, you should, you should film this. Like you should show people that you're actually hacking stuff, not just doing engineering. Um, so it was her idea to do it. I called a friend of mine who's a filmmaker and said, Hey, do you want to film this? And he's like, hell yeah, like, let's do it. Um, so I explained the whole process to him. We ended up hiring a friend of mine who's a camera, a, a, a cameraman, uh, producer, editor that had filmed, um, a project that I had made for wired during COVID called the pizza compass. That's completely separate engineering project of like a, a device that you'd push a button and anywhere in the world, it would tell you like where the nearest pizza place is and guide you there with leds. So we knew, we knew chase from there. So we hired him and we've just self produced and self filmed this whole story. Um, because Dan, the customer wanted to come in person to Portland to do the test. Like he wasn't going to mail me the device. He wanted to come in person. And uh, in order for that to happen, I had to already prove to him, I think I did it on four different Trezor devices, set them up with the exact same version of firmware, loaded up a little bit of cryptocurrency in there. I knew the recovery seeds and the pins because I had created them, but basically show the process, prove to him that I could do it before he flew all the way here. Uh, but he did, came here and we did our handoff. And then I started going in for the attack. Uh, the Trezor is ultrasonically welded together. So you have two pieces of plastic that are basically vibrated together really quickly to give some sort of like physical um, security, if you will. Uh, in our case, it doesn't matter because our attack was in the safety of our lab. It doesn't matter if I cracked that seam and, and somebody, you know, nobody's going to look later on and be like, oh, the device has been hacked. We didn't care. So I just took a knife and, and scraped it until I could open up uh, the device used a, uh, a solvent to get rid of the coating on, on the, uh, on the chips. So I could actually start like removing the capacitors and soldering wires. Then here I am like getting the board ready for the fault injection, adding on wires for the debug interface to make it easier to connect up to my interface board. And then here is a picture of the whole setup in action. Uh, and yeah. Here's what the oscilloscope looks like. So if you're curious about like, well, what is the, what is the fault injection? Like, what does the glitch actually look like? Um, the blue line is, is our, our core voltage. So that's the line that we're feeding in through that, um, through that one pin I showed in the block diagram, basically bypassing or turning off the internal voltage regulator. The green line down at the bottom is the reset line. That's what we're using to, to start the timing of when we need to do our glitch. Because the chip, basically when chips power up, it, they control the reset line. That's almost like a ready line kind of, uh, and that, that reset line is going to go high when the chip starts booting. So we basically use that as our starting point. And then the green line, or sorry, the, uh, the yellow line at the top is just our, our, our 3.3 volt rail. But the one that matters is that, that glitch on V core. And let me see, we're at one microsecond, uh, per division. So it's 500, yeah, 500 nanoseconds. If my math is right. Uh, for the width of the glitch. So very, very fast. And in our case, you can see it kind of goes down below ground and then it has this sort of ripple before it goes up. Like all of those characteristics matter. And it's just a, sometimes you have to screw around with like even different capacitance, like I mentioned, different wire lengths will cause the, the quality of that glitch or the, the, the behavior of that glitch to change. Um, so usually when you're doing your kind of analysis of the device, you'll run lots of loops of lots of different tests and different varieties of things. And then you basically see which is the most successful with, with the least amount of risk to do the attack. I don't know if the video is gonna play, but I'm actually like causing a glitch once per second, which is kind of slow. I've increased it since then, but there's some other problems that happen if you do things too fast. Um, I found that sometimes you can cause the chip to get corrupted more easily and there's other things, but this was at least what was happening at the time pretty slow. And I wanted to be very careful that I wasn't missing the spot where the RDP check was happening because Dan was here for a day. Uh, I didn't want to like try to do things too fast. So I just kept it as slow as I was doing on my actual attack, which meant it could take a number of hours for us to hit the right spot. 
because also I didn't mention this, even with the exact same chips, the timing is going to vary because of manufacturing uh, differences, the temperature in the room. So I was getting successes during the day, but I wasn't getting them at night when it was colder. Sometimes it's the opposite. Um, so I was just trying to replicate everything exactly as I was doing it for my test. So here we are like sitting around waiting. We got pizza uh, and it was like hours and hours. It was torment waiting. Um, and then it worked. We ended up getting one successful fault. Now we enabled the debug interface. Then we could go and extract all of the RAM from the device. And hopefully that's when fingers were crossed that we could actually see uh, the recovery seed in the pin stored in there. And then we see the result here of like, oh, there's the actual recovery seed, which I've blurred part of it out. Um, and we have the pin and some other stuff. Of course, we've moved all the contents out from there. And there's more words, but I got emails when the video went live. People had like um, unblurred, like using tools to unblur that portion. Uh, and they're like, you should probably like move your funds out. And it's like, of course, dude, like <laughs> we moved, the, there's $2 million on there. Like we moved it immediately. Um, but it's still pretty cool. And, um, this is something that I realized how lucky we were that the contents were actually there. And I talked about the chip crashing a lot when I was doing my testing. Um, because even after this, like there were times doing testing after the fact, hacking on other people's devices where I just was getting glitches, but there was nothing in memory. And no matter what I was doing, it just wasn't working. And then sometimes I got lucky. Uh, but then also I've noticed the more I do it, like the, the deeper you go with this stuff, um, you know, going from maybe hundreds of attempts to thousands or tens of thousands, uh, I've seen corruption of the devices where now you can't get back into the debug interface or it changes other parameters of things. So we just got super, super lucky that when we were filming this particular thing, uh, that it worked. So we were successful. We got the funds out of the device. Dan is in the middle. Chase, our camera guy, is, is off to the right. Um, super happy uh, that, we, that we got the funds off. And this is where we go, oh, okay, if Dan has this problem, probably other people do too. And that's, that's what started this, this, uh, this side thing, like I mentioned, called offspec.io to help um, people. And uh, I had no idea what we were going to get into. The video ended up being like super cool, like real dramatic. And um, it ended up going viral. And now it turns out like many millions of people have seen my lab and have seen my family and have seen uh, the process, which was pretty cool. But it also opened me up to like this whole world of cryptocurrency enthusiasts, um, which some of them are great, some of them maybe not so much. And uh, a whole range of cool technical problems too, of software wallets, hardware wallets, um, everything in between, you know, doing reverse engineering and, and password cracking and like all these different aspects of, of the kind of security world. So it has been really pretty cool. We ended up filming another video after this about hacking a guy's uh, cell phone to get contents off. And that's where it turns out, okay, not everybody actually has as much money as they think they do uh, in their wallets, uh, which was a, a real eye opener for me also. Um, but yeah, it's been kind of a fun process. And like I mentioned, I'm continuing to work on this stuff because that's just how I am. Like I, I've just been, you know, I knew it worked. I knew we were lucky, but I really want to get it to the point where I can run this thing and be comfortable enough that it's repeatable and reliable, um, you know, every time. And I might never get to the point where it's 100%, uh, but I want to at least understand like what's causing the corruption. How can we do, can we do other tricks that maybe uh, are safer that aren't going to cause as much corruption? or the risk of corruption, or maybe um, maybe there's some other techniques. Like I mentioned, we have RAM access through, through RDP level one. Maybe I can put some code in there that's then going to be safer to do fault injection on instead of doing it on the boot ROM code. Because the chip is going to be susceptible to fault injection, not just at the boot ROM phase, but during user code also. So I could do glitching later on. Um, but there's all sorts of work to, to do and to be done. And I've been working on that with a colleague of mine uh, now for like, probably about a year together. Uh, and every time we make progress, it's like, you know, one step forward, two steps back. We encounter some new thing, some new problem, some new new uh, failure that we hadn't seen before. So it really is one of these like things that it, it's a project that's very interesting, but super frustrating at the same time. But I know we're going to get there. Um, so, so the first stage of like making it reliable to downgrade. And then at that point, making it reliable of getting the contents out of Flash. Because Trezor, like I mentioned, fixed the problem where 
they're not copying stuff into RAM anymore, too risky. Uh, so we just need to focus on getting the flash memory out of the device, whether it's a Trezor device or anything else that's using an STM32. We can use the, the STM32 bootloader, do fault injection or other techniques, like I talked about getting you know, things executing out of RAM uh, to, to safely extract flash memory, because there's nothing worse than trying to do fault injection to extract flash memory and erasing the device. Uh, it's terrifying. And even when I've done it on test chips that I have just, you know, that don't have cryptocurrency on them, just my own test chips, it's still like my heart jumps when I see that I've erased the chip. Um, so it's something that happens and it would just be nice to kind of continue on with this work and get it to the point where it's repeatable enough that maybe even like it's more useful in an educational environment, right? Like we're using all off the shelf equipment that people can use. Um, people can use this stuff. Uh, and learn about fault injection with a cool kind of project at the same time. The code that I wrote is available on my website, along with a link to the video and, and all the documentation and everything. So if you at least wanted to start with what I had then, you can. Um, though, like I mentioned, there is a lot of work. There's a lot of like custom circuit boards I've made and other things to make it more accessible. Uh, and once we get this repeatability and reliability good enough, then all that stuff's going to be released as well, because it all comes down to like sharing this information. Um, even though for me, it's like, yeah, we, you know, maybe we'll help somebody recover some cryptocurrency. We take a percentage of it. Um, it's not about the money for me. It's about sharing this information. That's how it's always been as a hacker and being a hacker, it always comes first. So like sharing this stuff is cool because this goes out there. Somebody might read this and then they might create some other technique that could be used for something else. Then maybe I learn from that and use it for something else. And that's really what it's all about, right? It's like building this knowledge base um, and like set of code and set of tools that people can use. So as far as some lessons, um, general purpose microcontrollers. So microcontrollers that don't specifically have like a, a whole security design around them, even though they have code protection, um, security is not always suitable. Uh, so if you end up, you know, dealing with a system that has a general purpose microcontroller, it's probably going to be vulnerable in some way. Or if you're designing a system, uh, think about that. Like if you have something that you actually want to protect, don't use a general purpose microcontroller, use something that has better security features built in. The trade-off of that though, is that a lot of the chip manufacturers want you to sign a non-disclosure agreement. If they let you, if you are going to use the secure chip, um, which then means you can't talk about any problems that you find or anything like that. So it's, it's, a, it's a, I guess, an engineering security trade-off, like everything. Fault injection is dependent on a lot of different factors. I talked about this. Uh, it can be very, very frustrating. Um, to give you another example of this, there is, uh, in one of my classes, I have one exercise on defeating code protection of a different type of chip uh, that's much more susceptible to fault injection. Like you basically, as long as you're within like some range, like sometimes like the first, glitch you can you can bypass the the security um i had changed my exercise to add in some side channel power analysis first which basically changed the connections of how i had things um, connected to my target board i now had two cables connecting to like a t adapter and just adding that t adapter to the equation was preventing the fault from happening and for, for like a day, I was like, why is this not working? And then I realized, oh, maybe I should take that out and try it. And then it worked um, because it was affecting the quality of that glitch just enough where the chip now wasn't susceptible. But sometimes it is. So it really was like, it, dro it drove me, um, I, I again, got that imposter syndrome of like, even though I'd been doing this example in class for like probably a year or two, um, all of a sudden it wasn't working. And my first reaction was like, what, what did I do wrong? Um, but I left that in the exercise because it's something where it really, it really proves and it kind of brings that concept home of, of how everything matters with fault injection. So yeah, a lot of reverse engineering has to go into to getting things working, but when it does work, uh, it feels like magic. And that's what keeps me coming back to it. And we're seeing more and more uh, research, more and more presentations, more and more papers about fault injection because of how powerful it is. And unless the chip vendor uh, implements some sort of mitigation on their chip intentionally to prevent fault injection, the chip is going to be vulnerable, which is really cool from a hacker perspective. It's sort of like you think about IoT devices that are running some old version of Linux that, that haven't been updated or haven't been patched. Like it's that sort of thing. Everywhere you look, microcontrollers are susceptible to fault injection 
um, unless it's a product where the engineers had really thought about it and use a chip that already has mitigations. Um, so I do have some resources. These slides, by the way, are available uh, on my website. If you go um, to grandideastudio.com and search for Trezor, you will find them. So these links are clickable links, and you can actually go and read about some of the prior work that's out there, see the video, all of those things. Um, I will have to say my current website is a little bit in a state of disarray. Um, I'm working on a new website that should be out soon if I can get my act together. But the old version, like a lot of stuff doesn't work, but the link to this stuff does work. Uh, so at least it's there. You can, you can get going on this stuff if you want to. And with that, yeah, thank you for listening. That is my uh, story about recovering $2 million from the Trezor One. And there will be future, future work. So stay tuned for that. And uh, yeah, thank you. And let's see if we have questions or comments or anything like that. Oh, that was fantastic. That was an intense crash course on not just engineering, but adversarial thinking, which is great. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm a networks guy, so I'm not a hardware guy, but as you were describing the, the, the process of analyzing and um, the Tresner, I just kept flying to my mind. This is exactly the same approach that we will take when we're looking at um, a network as a red team or a pen tester or a yes. facility. Where are the dependencies? Is there a single point of failure that we could, you know, usurp or flip a bit somewhere to cause a disruption we can gain intel from and exploit that knowledge? So yeah. it just it just goes to show all of us that you know a lot of this mindset is um, universal in the security world. I mean, you can apply it to hardware, software, networks, buildings, people, you yeah. name it. Yeah, that's a great point. I mean, that that's a, a really great point of like this. This stuff, if you have the mindset, you can apply it to everything. And that's a lot of times what I tell people is um, the approach, we're going to take the same approach regardless of what it is. But if you start thinking about it as either the adversary or, you know, if you're an engineer, you think what the adversary is going to do. Or as an adversary, you think about the constraints of what an engineer has to do to implement a hardware product or a network thing or a piece of software or whatever it is. Then we think, okay, if they have... If they, if they don't have time to do it right, maybe they're using sample code, we can find the sample code, um, whatever it is. But yeah, you're absolutely right of like that, that process and the mindset of hacking, that is, that's the most important part and it can be applied across everything. Yeah, cool. So are there questions from the audience? Uh, feel free to put your question in chat or you can raise your WebEx uh, hand and, um, and, and we'll get you going. But please feel free if you've got a question or a comment. Or are you all thinking, ooh, we're we're like 40 minutes early now. We, if we don't ask questions, <laughs> we can just end. <laughs> well, actually, uh, so we have one question here from uh, JP Leach. JP, nice. uh, uh, unmute yourself and uh, go for it. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, can you all hear me? Yes. yes. Perfect. Joe, thank you very much for your time. I, I, I appreciate it greatly right off the bat here, and it was a great presentation. Um, and I wanted to catch your perspective as someone who's been in the industry uh, uh, for for a bit um, as to pose uh, uh, to some of us uh, who have not been necessarily. So from your perspective, um, what are some of the, the skills gaps in the, the security industry that you feel could be covered uh, a little bit better moving forward? That's a good question. Um, it's funny because there's a slide, I can't remember the report. Rick, do you remember the re that first report that came out in like the 70s about computer security? It was called like the something report. The where, the where report? The where report from, from Rand Corporation. Um, they had a block diagram in there of like a uh, mainframe and it had all the different potential threats uh, as far as like sniffing communication and human connection and administrator access, like all these things that they had laid out um, that is still true to this day, regardless of if it's network, software, hardware, whatever. Like it's fascinating to me that 50 something years later, um, the, the threats have been known, but we still haven't really gotten those problems solved. And sometimes it's frustrating to see like, yeah, I've been, I've been in the industry a long time and a lot of the hardware attacks, and I can only really talk to hardware because that's what I've seen, um, are kind of the same types of things over and over again. So while some devices and some products have gotten more secure, 
there are a lot of new devices that haven't been that are used that are kind of falling into the same traps and the same same problems over and over again. So it's um it's great job security, right? Because you because you know that things are going to be insecure, but the um the sometimes people get a little overwhelmed with that. And I think from a security side, so I think a lot of the problem is not from the security side, but it's from the the design side, the engineering side or the implementation side. Um, where if you're doing network implementation or network design, like you're probably working with security people, or maybe you're the same person and there's a little more integration there. But with hardware, it's really something where I know for a fact when I was in school, there was no discussion of security. Um, nowadays, I don't, I don't know if there is either. I know people are, are dealing with higher level tools, like there's more development environments, there's more access to electronics. Um, but I think there's still a, a, a separation between engineering and security where the engineers don't necessarily even really know that their devices are susceptible or how hackers could attack them. Um, we do, we see at, at, at trade shows like vendors pushing security, but the reality of it is like being an engineer, like the goal is to get the thing working and to get it manufacturable and get it out to market on time and have it pass all of its tests that it needs to pass. Uh, security is, is a very, very hard thing that, that usually gets kind of patched on at the end kind of like how it was with software like years, years and years ago. Um, but from a security side and like cybersecurity, I think it's, it's getting to the point where everybody should kind of have a baseline knowledge of hardware hacking. Um, and like we talked about, the process is the same. The thought process is the same. We're just using different tools. Um, but I think that's important because we have IoT, we have automotive, um, SCADA systems, like so many things are now electronic systems. They're computers but you sometimes need to have some more uh, lower level electronics knowledge as well uh, to kind of handle those. And it's just a matter of like, yeah, getting people excited about, about hardware hacking and, and trying things out and, and following resources that are out there. Um, but I think that's probably the gap of, uh, of just besides engineers not knowing security, it's getting more security people to, to understand engineering. And I think that, you know, having, having both sides of that is going to be pretty powerful. I don't know if that answers your question. <laughs> yeah, yes, definitely. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Other questions. Uh, we have a question in chat. I'm not sure if you've got chat open or not, but I'll read it. Okay. Uh, just a quick doubt. You can see that Flipper Zero is being used widely to hack into SDR and other hardware protocols like UART. What would be your inputs if someone asked about how they can protect their assets? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, yeah, so a tool like the Flipper Zero has has made the access to hardware hacking even easier. Um, I guess I would kind of compare it to like Metasploit, right? When Metasploit came out, everyone's like, "Oh, it's just going to be script kitties running running you know modules and whatever." But it also has been very powerful because people can create their own modules and do things, and it basically has made um, kind of uh, exploitation easier. And the Flipper Zero is one of those things where people get it and it has all sorts of applications already written for, you know, RFID cloning and NFC stuff and, and I button and um, UART interfacing. So yeah, it brings the, it brings the access a little bit higher. Um, with a properly designed electronic system, having a Flipper Zero isn't going to matter. The problem is having a properly designed electronic system is really, really hard. Um, there's a reason that I that I tend to be on the hacker side instead of the design side, because secure hardware design is 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 complicated. Um, all I can really say is like even if I recommend using a secure element or a, a type of chip that's designed to secure or, or to securely store data, um, that's going to buy you some time because there's maybe no known vulnerabilities at the time, but it doesn't mean you're totally secure. It means just right now you're better than anybody else. And as we know, it's a cat and mouse game. So you kind of have to just factor that into your design of like, is it worth the cost up front to make it harder for the attacker that maybe by the time there's an attack, uh, we're on to the next version. So I don't really have good recommendations. There are some specifications out there, some standards, um, some check boxes of things you can do for uh, like FIPS compliance or common criteria certification as far as like uh, design things you're supposed to do to make hardware more secure. Uh, but that doesn't really guarantee security. 
Um, there's a presentation on my website called Every Cloud Has a Silver Lining, I think it's called. And that has a list of some of those certifications and recommendations. So that's a starting point, but it, again, is not a guarantee. Um, and every solution is, is very product specific, just like with network, like not every network design is going to be the same, uh, with hardware, not every hardware design is going to be the same. What security feature that might work in one product isn't going to work in another. Um, so it, yeah, very, very hard. I don't, I don't have a good answer other than like starting to look at the recommendations and maybe use some of those and hope that, that they can be implemented properly. Uh, so at least there's no human caused problems where there usually is, uh, and then just sort of knowing that eventually if somebody wants to break something, if it's financially worth it or whatever the, the goal is, like it will probably get broken eventually. Um, it's just, it is it, by that time, is that okay if it happens? Okay. Other questions? Um, another one from chat. Can you suggest any other tools which can be used as a replacement for Flipper Zero, which has not gotten as much limelight as Flipper oh. Zero? Yeah, I mean, um, so Flipper Zero is great, like great marketing, right? Or whatever they did, like it's cute, um, good design, which kind of proves to you like that's that's an important thing. Um, so Rick had mentioned the JTagulator in in my bio, uh, which is something that that was a tool that I created, an open source tool um, to help people find JTAG interfaces, UART interfaces, SWD interfaces on their target devices. And it's something that if you're getting into hardware hacking, if you don't really have the skills or the time to like analyze a circuit board to find those things, um, it's really easy to just like wire it up and run it. So that's one tool that's handy. The Flipper Zero has a little bit of that functionality, but not to the level of the JTagulator. Um, I did just discontinue manufacturing of it uh, just because I felt like it, um, but it is all open source. You can still get it. Uh, I will still probably do some firmware updates once in a while, but that's one tool that's useful. One that I was hoping the JTagulator would roll into, and the JTagulator might continue on its life. Um, I've been talking to some other people that might want to still manufacture it. Um, but what I was hoping the JTagulator could roll into is a tool called Glasgow, um, like the city in to Scotland, I hope. <laughs> and um, that's a, a, a product made by uh, Peter Esden, who runs a company called One Bit Squared. And that is like this FPGA based, basically like a universal digital hardware interface. Um, kind of like the bus, bus Pirate, which is another tool. There's a new version of the Bus Pirate called the Bus Pirate version five. That's pretty cool. Um, so that's something to look into. But Glasgow basically gives you like unlimited capabilities for any sort of digital protocol interaction. Uh, and he started to ship those. There were some problems with, with supply chain, like a lot of products had. Um, but that's a super cool, like really universal platform. Um, so you could do, you know, very timing um, specific digital protocols to do uh, injection or sniffing of information or person in the middle types of things. So yeah, definitely a tool I would check out. Um, Chip Whisper, of course, uh, they're actually, the one I showed in the slides is the Chip Whisper Pro, but Colin is now um, making a, a device called the Chip Whisper Husky, which combines um, the Pro with some of the lower end devices that he made into kind of one unified product. So that's something that is like for, for side channel and fault injection, like that's that's worth getting as well. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of other tools out there. The Flipper Zero is sort of like the entry level. Maybe that's the gateway drug for people. Um, and if you're on the engineering side or, or like, you know, the security side of inside of a, a, a vendor, it's like, all right, maybe we'll use the Flipper Zero to see if somebody can detect certain things. Um, but it really, yeah, it's like an entry level for, uh, for hardware hacking. And then there's other tools that will get, let you get much lower level for attack and also understanding the... Uh, weaknesses of a particular device. Uh, another question. Could you maybe tell us about the DEF CON attendee badges? <laughs> <laughs> cool. <laughs> um, I wish I had some here. They're all in a, in a box in, in another part of my office. Um, so yeah, the DEF CON badges, uh, some of you may have been to DEF CON and over the past couple of years, kind of the, the theme has been like electronic badges. And we see these at a lot of other conferences as well of like your attendee badge has some electronics on it, maybe it blinks lights, maybe it has a puzzle. Um, 
maybe there's like a, a CTF type of challenge in it. Um, and yeah, I guess the, the story of those is back in DEF CON 14, which I don't even remember the date, 2005, 2006, um, was the first electronic badge. And actually the, the going back even further, um, the, uh, the dark tangent. So Jeff Moss, who runs DEF CON, also ran Black Hat. He had started Black Hat and, and uh, was running that at the time. And he had just started doing training classes, which now is like, you know, the whole industry of doing training. And it's actually how I um, make a living most of the time is through training. But back then it was just starting. And he was like, you should do a, a hardware hacking training class for Black Hat. Um, and I was like, okay, like, is anyone going to want to see? Like, who knows? So I put a curriculum together. I made a circuit board that is a little G-shaped circuit board in the, in the shape of my logo, which is for Grand Idea Studio. Um, and that was the circuit board that we used in the training class for soldering and desoldering and, and um, sniffing signals and, and manipulating memory and all sorts of stuff. And I still use, I still use that to this day. It's been modified over time. Um, but Jeff saw that in this custom shape and said, hey, we should do something like that for DEF CON. So that was 2005. And then that year of DEF CON uh, is when the first electronic badge came out, which was in the shape of the DEF CON logo. And it had blinky eyes that would do things. And for me, it was a really fun thing to kind of mass produce, you know, make 6,000 uh, at the time, 6,000 electronic badges and basically introduce the DEF CON community to electronics because there was very little electronics going on at the time uh, at DEF CON. It was network, software, Wi-Fi, everything other than electronics. And being a hardware person, like I'd always been fascinated with electronics. So it was a great opportunity to sort of bring that to everybody. Kind of, you had this captive audience because everybody had to get that badge. And I had a little badge hacking contest. Uh, there was like a handful of people that modified their badge and did cool stuff with it. And that ultimately became like a black badge challenge. So people who won that would get lifetime entry to DEF CON. But for the first couple of years, like it basically was, what can we do next? Like what cool thing, what cool art um, aesthetic thing can we do? What new puzzle do we add in there? Uh, and it was kind of a competition with myself to see like what I could do next um, and kind of use my engineering school skills, but have them use in kind of a fun hacker way. Um, so yeah, DEF CON. 14 through 18 were the five badges that I had designed. Uh, and then I retired. I was like, all right, after that, like people are now expecting an electronic badge. Uh, let's stop doing them and see what happens. I thought that would be kind of fun. Um, so Ryan Clark lost, took over. He did some badges and then it started changing to other things, but it was cool because it, it brought some new flavor into what the badge could be. And it wasn't just me thinking about something, right? It was like different people. And that's what kind of, makes the community. So that was kind of cool. Um, I did come out of retirement for DEF CON 27 and for DEF CON China, which was the same year, uh, right before COVID. And when I did the DEF CON 27 badge, which was a, a gemstone with electronics on the backside, um, every time I did the badge was a great opportunity to, to try new techniques that I wouldn't normally do. So I talked right at the beginning about, you know, if the opportunity, the opportunity has to be there and, and kind of the right situation. Uh, for DEF CON 27, I'd never worked with like micro BGA. Actually, I'd never worked with any BGA components. So ball grid array, basically components that have solder balls as the connections underneath the part. And I'd always wanted to work with those. There's all sorts of other stuff that I wanted to try. And this was the opportunity to do it with this ridiculous deadline of DEF CON that couldn't change. And we had to make 28,600 badges. Um, so it was quite a shift from 6,800, even though a lot of the process is the same. When you get to that scale, uh, time frame matters, cost matters, like much more. So it was pretty fun to do that, and um, very happy with that one. What's funny though is that I didn't put any any puzzles in it um, because I'm not really a puzzle person. I'm more of like a engaging the community person. So that badge had a challenge where you had to basically go to different types of people at DEF CON. Uh, if you were a speaker or a goon or a vendor or press you had to go and communicate with other types of people. And that particular badge had um, near field magnetic induction. So like a, a, a wireless communication method and you could hold your badges up and they'd communicate. You could hold multiple badges up and they would all communicate. So bringing the community together and having people at DEF CON do different activities to meet with different types of people, which was pretty fun. Um, 
but it was funny to see the human the human kind of reaction because a lot of times like the attendees had sort of been trained of like the badge is going to have a puzzle but it wasn't a puzzle so they they were looking for puzzles that weren't there and i thought that was it was a fun social experiment to sort of watch people um, as they were doing that but it was a great way to see this interaction with everybody and then defcon china was a flexible badge i'd never done flexible circuitry before so that was really fun um and yeah it's just taken on a life of its own like if you look at badge life um nowadays like it's a thing and it's really really cool to see that and speaking of defcon i will actually show you this i just got this um this was given this was announced at, at defcon over the summer but i wasn't actually there it was like the first year that i wasn't at defcon in a long time but this is the defcon uber contributor award um this is the second year they've done it and it says um joe kingpin grand endless curiosity and innovation the original spirit of badge life so it's pretty rad like this wow. block of aluminum um but very cool to like to have to be part of that history and like have that recognition of like that that never was the intent right it was like to do this stuff to get hardware in front of people um but to to have that and, and to to be like a, a a known quantity in that community now is like it's pretty cool like it it feels good um and i'm proud of that especially seeing how things have flourished since then of like yeah beyond anybody's expectation that's for sure Other other questions, comments. We saw one such badge making activity by Hacker One at Black Hat Twenty Three. Uh, that was a beginner one. Can you suggest any hardware exploitation certification courses which are affordable to students? I don't really know if there's any actual certifications. Um, there are a lot of different classes. Uh, as far as affordability, that's a good question. Um, DEF CON has workshops, uh, DEF CON does trainings now too, but they have some workshops. Um, yeah, like I'll do, I'll do public conferences once in a while, um, for, for training classes, but all the material that I use is on my website anyway, just not in as nice of a, a form factor. Um, so I don't really know if there's, if there's courses per se, like Joe Fitzpatrick does some virtual courses. Um, Thomas Roth and uh, is his name, is it fail overflow or live overflow? Oh, I, I'm gonna get this wrong, but they just started a company called Hexview or Hextree, something like that. Um, that's doing a whole series of different types of uh, kind of hardware hacking, software hacking training classes. Uh, but yeah, I don't know if there's anything like, uh, you know, CISSP for hardware or something like that. Um, but really I think a lot of it still is um, just kind of getting the experience on your own and having that experience instead of having a certification about it. But uh, probably eventually there'll be some sort of, you know, certifying body around some curriculum somewhere. We'll call it the grand certification. Yeah, exactly. Stamp of approval. Yeah, you're right. Because the industry is asking for certifications and that's, that's a, that's a debate on its own, right? Of like the certifications matter, um, do degrees matter? Uh, and there's, positives and negatives to all of that stuff. Um, but I think, yeah, with hardware, because there is no certification, you can basically just say, this is what I've done. Like, these are the projects I've worked on. This is, this is what I found. Um, and, you know, if somebody's asking for a hardware certification, then you probably don't want to work there anyway, because they, they, they must not have done their research to realize like there probably isn't one. Yeah. Good point. Good point. Yeah. All right. Uh, any other questions or comments? Can you raise your hand or we can put it in chat? Going once. <laughs> Going twice. This is usually when somebody pops in with Yeah, right. <laughs> All right. Well, I don't see any questions or hands raised. So, uh, Joe, thank you so much for uh, spending part of your uh, your evening with us uh, out here on the East Coast. Um, this was a fantastic uh, and in depth, um, if not mind blowing, for those of us not of the hardware side of the house <laughs> uh, uh, talk. I think we all definitely come away with this a little more educated on this. It's a fantastic tale, 
and certainly I think one that uh, folks can draw inspiration from as they you know move through their studies and certainly in, into the uh, in and through the profession. Yeah, awesome. Uh, well, thank, thanks. Yeah, thanks again for for having me. I appreciate it. And I will mention also, um, I do have a Discord server that uh, if people want to join and ask questions or follow along with what other people are doing, it's it's very low volume, um, and probably the best way. I'm trying to think of how to even how to even get there. Um, if you go to my Twitter page, like twittercom slash Grand or search for Joe Grand, um, I have a link tree, which is like um, just search link tree Joe Grand. Like that has a link that has all the links to all of my stuff. There are some Joe Grand impersonators out there, so be careful uh, because of the cryptocurrency stuff. Um, I've had to kind of set up social media presence on all sorts of places that I wouldn't normally do. Uh, Twitter is the main place where I'm kind of posting stuff occasionally, but Discord, uh, if you are curious about learning and stuff, um, that could potentially be a good place to start. And then there's some links on there also of frequently asked questions and other resources for getting into hardware hacking and all of that stuff. So yeah, thanks again for coming and listening and, and good luck with uh, all your stuff in the future. Thanks again, to Dr. Costin. Any final, uh, any final comments? I just wanted to say thank you, Joe, again, for when I reached out, you know, agreeing to chat with the class and the, the entire university and the program on this. It definitely, you know, opens the eyes to all the, you know, possibilities for all the students. And, you know, I'm sure a lot more students hopefully will go towards the hardware route because I'm a hardware guy myself. I, yeah. I, like, I love hardware. So I'm, I'm hoping from this, you know, this opens eyes to like the possibilities. Yes, and there are a lot of possibilities. You're right. So there's a lot of ways to go um, and a lot of cross pollination, too. So, you know, people can can have different interests and combine them together. Uh, and, you know, cybersecurity now is just. Multidisciplinary, right? So this is, um, yeah, hopefully people get into it and uh, yeah. Thumbs up. Awesome. Well, Joe, thanks again so much and thank you all for joining us this evening. And uh, this video uh, will be on the uh, the the uh, UMBC Center for Cybersecurity YouTube channel uh, later this well later this week probably tomorrow sometime. So uh, thanks so much for joining us and have a great evening. Cool. All right. See ya. Bye. Bye.